Hola, muchas gracias por estar en sintonía de Onda UNED. Eh, estamos de nuevo acá desde el primer encuentro REDIC 2019, desde el edificio de educación continua de la Universidad de Costa Rica, un encuentro organizado por el PROIFED de la UNED, el programa de investigación en fundamentos de educación a distancia. Este, y pues es un placer acompañarles desde acá. Y hoy con Norman Vaughn, él es, eh, viene desde Canadá, desde Calgary. Eh, nos decía hace un rato que en la base de las montañas rocallosas bellísimas de Canadá <ríe> eh, Y pues vamos a comenzar preguntándole eh, a Norman que por favor eh, nos cuente un poco acerca de su trabajo Y lo vamos a hacer en inglés que es su idioma natal So thank you Vaughn for being with us And uh, if you, you may start telling us about your exciting job back in Calgary, such a beautiful place. I will. And just to begin, how excited I am to be here again in Costa Rica. I was here about 10 years ago for a family vacation and we all fell in love. So when the opportunity came to come again, I was very excited to be here. As you mentioned, I live in Calgary, Alberta, which is in the western part of Canada. It's the gateway to all our beautiful Canadian Rocky Mountain parks. Um, I'm a professor at Mount Royal University. I'm involved in the teacher education program there, but my research primarily focuses around blended learning and student engagement. And it's something I've had the privilege to work at for, boy, almost about the past 15 years. And what's been exciting is to see how blended learning has grown and involved, not only at my other institution, but around the world, which has been really exciting. Um, because again, obviously we have different cultural contexts and things like that. But how important I think it is, is that we use these different modes of communication to help students found, find their voice and really empower them. So that's really what my research is about, is how do we use different modes of education for students to learn how to learn, to really feel like they have a voice in the world. Um, we, we kind of, um, so if we use the term blended education, yes. that means we have a mix between what we would consider distance learning and what we consider traditional learning. Explain us how you have deal with it. Well, and again, this is important because I think that was the original definition is that you would have students physically on campus so they'd have that face-to-face -face experience and then like you said at a distance they'd be working through the different Moodle or different learning management the different digital technologies so they could be online but it's fascinating I've really seen that change and this is what's exciting for me about distance education because it's always evolving um, a colleague of mine here Robert was talking about the power of of the radio and and I think there's always something about the power of voice voice is so important in terms of telling our stories and making human connections so what's been really exciting for me is with these advent of technologies we now have blended online learning and what that allows us to do is be anywhere at any time and the beauty is is that you don't all have to be physically together um, in terms of physical location, but we can still be together by using applications like Zoom or other web conferencing. And I found this has been particularly effective, especially with our indigenous people who have oral traditions. The way they learn is through their stories, isn't through textbooks. So again, I think this is powerful because it helps people follow, find their voice in distance environments. So they may not be physically side by side, like I am looking at you at an eye, but we are looking at each other in the eye through the use of a computer. Yeah, and um, Catch, is, is Calgary the state that is over uh, where the Glacier National Park is in the US? It is, yes. Okay, so that's where there are a lot of indigenous communities around that area and they, um, as far as, as, as I understand, that's quite an issue for them and it is for our indigenous people as well, how, um, they have to adapt to this really hard for them reading environment, whereas they are talkative. So I just want to build on that because again, you know your geography really well. Um, so again, we're due north of Montana. And again, there were indigenous people throughout North America, um, throughout Canada. I think the recent number I heard was 682 different tribes or different groups, different dialects. The issue that's coming to the forefront now is I think we're just really realizing um, the impacts. And again, there was a lot of negative impacts of colonization around the world. And what we've really tried to do in Canada, 
especially with our current government, is give a voice to our indigenous people, much like Nelson Mandela did in South Africa. We call it the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, where we really acknowledge the wrongs, what happened in the past. But what I find, it's not only giving the indigenous people a voice, but it's us, us Europeans, us settlers or colonizers, learning from their indigenous ways of, of learning, which are so important because they've inhabited our country for thousands of thousands of years before we came, and we're causing all kinds of environmental problems. So it's time to go back and look at it from a base. So like you mentioned, with the indigenous people, one thing that's really important is the oral traditions because they traditionally didn't have a print-based way of communication. But the other important thing for their learning is their, land, their learning takes place on the land. The learning doesn't take place in a room like this, a classroom. It really is experiential learning. You're learning in connection with nature. And I think we're learning more and more about the importance of place-based learning, getting our students out of these classrooms and actually learning in context with the environment. How, how does this work with, um, you know, things like maths or, uh, business administration, you know, things you wouldn't think you could learn outside. Well, and again, you know, we look at, especially with math or the sciences, we look at somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, who was an incredible mathematician and a scientist, but also a great artist. And just his whole idea, the Mona Lisa, is perspective. And I think this is where it makes it really exciting, because especially something like math, when we learn math in a classroom, it's often abstract. It really isn't connected to the way we think or the, the way we interact with our environment, where we go out and we do mathematics. For example, we have a, a structure called a teepee. Oh, and yeah, it's yeah. all, no, but it's made of angles. It's mathematics. In, 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 it, actually erecting a teepee is very mathematical in terms of getting the right angles correct and create, in terms of creating the right circle. So, so that's the, the, the teepee for our audience is this yes. uh, triangle house that the Aborigines have. Triangle Aborigine house, having. which they'd often have the hides of animals and it'd be a, a, a dwelling that they were able to live in even during the warm areas, but they were nomadic people who had to move where the bison were. So it was a, a type of habitation where you could very quickly take it down and move to the next area where the animals were. Yeah, so they are, you use those sorts of things for teaching maths, for example. We do, and what's really exciting for me is we're doing it not just for the indigenous people, but we're doing it for all the students because as my colleague Roger mentioned, Canadian all, Canada always has been a land of immigrants. I mean, when we even look at our indigenous people, it's said that they came across a land bridge from Asia, from probably northern Russia, Japan. So it's been wave after wave of immigrants. And I think the problem with us is we haven't respected a lot of that historical knowledge. And now that we have so many major environmental problems in our country and the world, we're really going back to our roots and it's exciting. So these te teachings in terms of putting up a teepee, that's just not for the indigenous people. We're doing that in our public school system with all our students. And that also kind of gives a sense, like once I began to work in, in this university, I began to have contact with, with Costa Rican indigenous people. And to me, the feel of connection with my land after working with them is so much strong. Uh, so that definitely gives a different perspective also to, to settler people as well. Well, and again, this is a real issue in um, our country because, um, you know, I don't think we're much different than Costa Rica in terms of our colonization or history. The reason the Europeans came was to extract raw materials from the ground um, in terms of coal, in terms of minerals, in terms of oil, without any respect for the land. And that's caused us a lot of grief because after doing that for years and years and years, the rivers are polluted, we can't drink for the rivers, we can't eat the fish, which means we as humans can't live. So I think this is what is exciting for me is by having this place-based, this land-based um, um, education, all of us, all Albertans, all Canadians are gaining a greater respect for the earth. Well, that's, that's an amazing teaching. 
Um, so apart from this experiential teaching, what other things have you realized through blending? Meditation? Well, and again, I think this is what's exciting for us because um, using the technologies, we can blend and we can compare and contrast because again, Canada is such a huge country, but the population is really dispersed. Most of our population lives around the American border. So what's exciting for me for blended learning and also the use of what we're doing, digital technologies, is children can be creating their own stories, working with their elders, the indigenous elders on the land, and then sharing those stories with other indigenous people in other parts of Canada. So we're learning through the elders, through the stories, but we're using these technologies to document it and learn from each other's stories. So what's really exciting for me about this blended learning is the content is not developed by the experts, it's developed by the learners. And I think that's really empowering and exciting, and especially for our indigenous people, where they, they see that we as the settlers value their culture and that we want to learn from them. And it's really, we want to learn with them. And it goes, uh, it reminds me a lot to the pedagogy of the oppressed of Paulo Freire is really, the implementation of that. And I've been surprised that I've found this Latin American philosophy being much more present in Anglo-Saxon educational systems than it is in Latin American educational systems. And you know, I just want to comment that it's really interesting how we learn from other cultures in other ways. Often if it's something happening in our own, our own culture, for some reason we don't respect it and we don't look at it as something serious. Whereas it, when it comes from someone else, somehow it's magical or it's different. And again, speaking of Paulo Freire, you know, just the work that he did in Brazil, but how important that has been in Canada, because I really give our country a, little, a lot of credit. It's about equity of access. It's providing quality of education to everyone. And again, I think it was not just Paulo Freire, but I remember him saying the strength of a democracy is our public education system and our public radio and communication stations because it means everybody has access to the same opportunities and so we really have embraced his 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 thinking his framework in canada well we we should learn back now yes that's the, that's <laughs> the good thing about uh, knowledge you create something it goes somewhere else it enriches and then it may be used back. And, and, and you know, again, I just, this, this has been such a wonderful conference to be at because we have people here from Spain, we've got people from Mexico. And again, I hate to say it, but you know, the more you know, the more you don't know. But even though we do have obviously different cultures, different sensitivities, I think there are some human emotions, some human values that are common no matter what culture we're from. And I think that's what we should strive for is learn, respect for each other's cultures, but really the empathy, really, it's the idea that we grow together, not apart. What has cut you from Costa Rica's educational system as far as you know? Well, it was interesting. Again, my colleague Robert um, uh, did a session yesterday just around policy and he had some slides comparing Canada and Costa Rica. And the one thing that struck me right away is in terms of what we call gross domestic product, the GDP, oh, yeah. Costa Rica spends 7%. They spend more money on education than we do in Canada. Now, part of that can be explained, you know, we've got the private or whatever, but again, I think it's so important because again, if you wanna have a strong, vibrant country, you need to have access and again, it's access not just to education, but healthcare. And I'm getting a little political here, but this is the big difference between Canada and the United States is that we have a universal healthcare system and we have universal education. So everybody has the opportunity. Whereas again, I am, I'm gonna criticize it, but in the United States where they really have a strong focus on capitalism, the privatization often takes away those opportunities from, I'll be honest, the majority of the population. Yeah, no, definitely. And that has been a huge discussion in this country in the late years. Uh, the, the, the wish of many private sectors of reducing that GDP percentage is huge. The pressure of the private media. Uh, so that's, that's one of the big discussions of 21st century. Well, and I think it's worldwide. Again, it was wonderful. We had um, um, Alan Tate as our opening keynote from uh, Great Britain. And what's really fascinating is, you know, he was one of the founders of the Open University in the UK, which models we followed all around the world. And he said, that's his biggest concern 
is that we've lost sight of taking care of our fellow man or fellow woman. And again, we've often put profit at the expense of humanity. And I think this is a concern. We've got an election going on right now in our province. And again, when people hear the word taxes, unfortunately, they think of there, something's being taken away from them. They don't realize it's an investment. It's an investment in our infrastructure, our road system. It's an investment in, in our civilization. It's our culture. <laughs> this is a very good discussion. <laughs> Well, but this is the sort of discussions we need to take on yes. and, and that leads to how we rule education, how we treat our indigenous people. Well, it is, but it's also, I think, in terms of, of um, access, because, again, I think this is exciting what we've got going on in distance and online, but there's a cost. Um, you know, this equipment, there's a cost in making sure that we've got internet, we've got wire coverage to our entire country, not just to the urban centers. And this has been a huge cost for us in Canada. And I really give it credit to um, what united our country was by building a railway from the east to the west coast. And it's the same with this. We call it sort of the, um, the super highway, the internet. It's so important that everybody has connectivity to these exciting learning opportunities, because if it doesn't, we're going to have a marginalized population again. How is it working with indigenous communities? Do they have access? So this is a problem again, just the way the technology works right now. They have access, but the quality of access is still not what you find in an urban center. In an urban center, we still have the fixed, um, you know, we've got the, um, the internet, whatever, the, the, the fiber optic the cable. Fiber optic, yeah. Whereas in the northern areas, we're relying on satellite coverage, which still isn't that great. And the problem is there's been a marginalization. We used to have public satellites, the Canadian government, and we've cut back and we're relying more and more on private providers and telecom telcos, telecommunications, which are there to make a profit. And again, it's tough to make a profit in these areas where you've got small populations. Uh, definitely that, that change from private to to public and uh, from probably to private uh, it's quite an issue uh, we we had that with our telecom company which is state-owned yes and it was open to competition and that created many issues which I guess uh, I think Bell Canada was yes. used to be Canadian wasn't it and it still is but again you know that's something again the americans would love to come in because we've got maybe bell canada we've got rogers tell us we've got maybe three or four major canadian private telecoms but they are subsidized from our federal government but again we have a lot of these american people who want to come in but our concern is again is just the coverage and i'll be honest even for me i think it's a safety issue i enjoy being in the mountains and this is only maybe 60 kilometers from calgary which is a large urban center about one and a half million people suddenly we don't have any coverage and this is for tourism and everything you know we've got people climbing mountains or in in, in rapids or whatever and there's no if if somebody gets hurt we don't have the coverage and again it's because these telcos they can't make a profit. And, and this is where we're going to have a discussion about those sort of public and private partnerships, which can be very controversial. Like for example, in here, all the discussion with uh, data rates, yes. uh, which used to be, you used to be to pay a fixed rate yes. to use all the data you wanted. And that has had huge implications in education. I don't know if that's the case there as well. Well, similar to us, because again, I think it's so exciting when we can stream educational videos and things like that, and that's become cost prohibitive. The one thing that our government did a good job is they created what was called community access programs, CAPS, because they realized in a small community, the infrastructure just wasn't going to work for each household to have this sort of access or cell plans. So working with the local libraries or local community areas, they've tried to establish high speed access within that. And I think that's been helpful as well, because unfortunately it means you can't quite get it from your house, but by coming to a public center or library or a community center, there's the social aspect, you're learning together, and we also have a community leader who's leading the education and helping connect with external experts. But again, I think it's important because it's really starting to build the leadership and the local capacity, which I think is important because when we rely too much on a central area, and for some reason the central area is cut off, we've lost not just the local culture, but the local leadership and the empowerment of those local people. I guess that helps also to some sort of media literacy as well. 
the, it's media literacy, and I think it's really important because that's a huge issue with us, is again, having all these different cultures and whether we like it or not, how dominant English is. And so that's been an issue with media literacy and producing um, educational materials in the local languages is so expensive because it's a small group and they get smothered with English. So again, if we can start creating more videos and things like that in the native language, and also a lot of the elders who, who hold, who are the knowledge keepers. If we they speak have, their language. Well, but we need to capture it through videos and that because we're not going to get it into books, but we need to capture their stories now rather than later. Well, thank you very much, Norm, for, for this uh, talk to us. Uh, I, I guess you wanted to say something else. Well, I just wanted to say thank you because it went a different way. Again, it's really interesting. My research is around blended learning and um, a student engagement, but more and more, just I've had the, the privilege of working with indigenous people. I spent five years up in the very far north. And for me, it's been a really passionate, it's been a selfish experience because again, I'm hoping to empower the indigenous, the local people, but the learning that I've learned from them has been so empowering for me. And it really has opened my eyes to a lot of new possibilities and a new way for all of us to work. Yeah, we always come as, uh, you're, you're, I'm the academic, I know. And yeah. then when you arrive there, you realize, no, you don't. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Norm. Uh, y pues muchas gracias a vos por estar en sintonía de Onda UNED. Le agradecemos también a, a Robert, nuestro entrevistado anterior, que también nos ayudó en la parte técnica. Este, y nos despedimos desde acá, desde el edificio de Educación Continua de la Universidad de Costa Rica, en este eh, primer encuentro internacional REDIC 2019. Hasta luego, pura vida.